So today we are discussing one of the key concepts in the Gita about how the, the subtlety and the complexity by which modes, the modes interact with each other. So I'll talk this based on 1835 in the Bhagavad Gita, which talks about intelligence in the mode of ignorance. So Krishna is speaking over here that actually Yaya Swapnam Bhayam Shokam. So he's giving the characteristics of say laziness, fearfulness, lamenting, illusion, dreaminess. Na vimunchati durmedha. When one doesn't give that up, Dhruti Sapartha Tamasi, that is intelligence in the mode of ignorance. So <clears throat> we'll discuss these two concepts today. How knowledge and ignorance, I mean, we normally think of knowledge as the opposite of ignorance, but how they, they may not be opposite. And how intelligence and foolishness can both go together. And then lastly, we will try to discuss about how knowledge and intelligence can work for us and not against us. Now, in the overall flow of the Gita, this is an analysis of how action works or how we can make action work in a way that is uh, uplifting and not degrading for us. In the previous session, we discussed about the various factors in action. And we also discussed what the concept of the doer is or what it means when it is said that we are not the doers. Primarily means we are not the sole doers. So today we will discuss about how there are two resources which are critical for action, action and how these resources relate with each other and what it means for us when we function in our lives. So for example, uh, the way the Gita differentiates between knowledge and knowledge and intelligence, let's look at that first. So now, now we can use the word knowledge mm, in various senses. Knowledge can refer to the information content in our brain. It can refer to, oh, this person has a lot of knowledge. Somebody can have a lot of political knowledge. Somebody can have sports knowledge. Somebody can have philosophical knowledge. So it can refer to information content in the brain. Now, knowledge is also used in a more nuanced sense when Krishna talks about jnana in the 13th chapter. It talks about qualities, values, virtues. So the self and its value system, that can refer to knowledge. And knowledge can be refer, refer to vision or our map of the world. So Krishna uses here jnana in that sense how we perceive the world. So if we wanted to, if the word, word knowledge is a little confusing in this particular context, uh, here what it means is perception. How are we perceiving the world? Uh, <clears throat> so we could also say that this perception in the three modes. And when we act, we perceive the world, then we process that information in our head and then we pursue something. We, act to gain some, uh, to achieve something. So that is, per so perception is what Krishna talks in terms of knowledge. Mm. And then what does intelligence mean? Uh, so knowing, intelligence can mean how, knowing how and why to keep things in perspective. So intelligence, it is, we have discussed earlier how it refers to keep things, keeping things in perspective and keeping, making sure that small things don't overshadow big things in our life. That we keep small things small and keep big things big. So that is one way of understanding intelligence. Here, it, intelligence refers basically to how we function purposefully in the world. So in that sense, if you want to use a drive, if you want to met, use a, driving metaphor. I'll come to this metaphor toward the end again in the talk. So if you're driving, somebody has a proper map. And by map, I just don't refer to Google Maps, but also one is 
perceiving okay okay this is a right turn over here this is this is a school section so i have to drive slowly over here so it is taking in the information properly so having a proper map having a proper awareness of the territory in which we are driving that is knowledge and then just having that awareness is not enough for actually driving well now driving well means when it's you know when to press the gas when to press the uh, brakes mm, how much distance to keep between one vehicle and the next vehicle how to take turns properly so there is a driving awareness and then there is driving ability so in when krishna uses the word knowledge he is referring to driving awareness and when krishna is referring to intelligence he is referring to driving ability so when he talks about intelligence you will see he is talking about how we navigate how we regulate our senses and how we pursue purposeful activities in our life that's what he's talking in terms of intelligence so <clears throat> why is this important because say in today's world we will be able we will see many people who are at one level very knowledgeable and at another level they seem to be ignorant they seem to be foolish so that means in terms of say their awareness they might be very intelligent they might have a lot of awareness but in terms of their ability they may not have much ability now this kind of cognitive dissonance struck me for the first time in my college days when i studied engineering i saw it as i was more interested in science uh, and i thought the study of science and overall scientific knowledge with the beat applied scientific knowledge also as a way to improve human society and not just improve human society by providing better facilities for living but i thought that just the quest of knowledge would be so exciting and fulfilling that that would improve human character also but then i noticed that there were there were people who were brilliant there was people who were far more there were students who were far more brilliant than me and yet behaviorally they seemed to be deficient you know they they had many bad habits and they seemed to be indulging in activities that were self destructive so somebody who could brilliantly process any electronic engineering problem that person was a chain smoker and i couldn't understand why so that person had that ability a lot of ability but in terms of activity sorry in terms of awareness that person had a lot of information but in terms of actual functioning in the world it was not so good so that's why we had discussed two things i said topic today is how can somebody be knowledgeably ignorant and how can somebody be intelligently foolish so we see this a lot in today's world because we have progressed a lot in various branches of knowledge so whether it be in the not just scientific knowledge yes scientific knowledge is phenomenal progress but in various other areas also there can be linguistic knowledge in which there can be a lot of progress and what to speak of some people might study humanities and they may study philosophy and they might have a lot of philosophical awareness we could say but does that translate into any any more uplifting or enlightened form of living not necessary so that's what we'll try to discuss today and so based once we get these two definitions of knowledge and intelligence uh, clear for ourselves let's move forward so krishna talks about knowledge in the three modes and what does he say about this knowledge in the three modes in knowledge and ignorance what happens at the over there is this knowledge and ignorance is one only sees the things that confirm our existing conceptions and we reject everything else so krishna talks about this in 1822 and there he says that yetu krishnavad ekasmin karye saktama haitukam atattvarthavad alpam cha tattama samudharatam yetu krishnavad ekasmin when man takes one thing to be everything that is knowledge in the mode of ignorance and one so if we consider knowledge to be like a big circle is only one small fragment of that knowledge one is taking and one is rejecting everything else 
So that is knowledge in the mode of ignorance. And the knowledge in the mode of passion is Prutakvenatu yadgyanam nana bhavan prutakvidhan vetti sarveshu bhuteshu tadgyanam vidhirajasam So where one is sees only the material side of reality and not only the material side, it is only the sensual side. So the specific Krishna, in the context of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna gives the example that when one looks at people and sees that their bodies are who they are essentially. And um, there's nothing beyond that. That is more knowledge in the mode of passion. So then there is knowledge in the mode of a goodness where one sees matter and spirit bo both. <clears throat> where one sees that there is sarva bhuteshu ye naikam bhavam avayam ikshate avibhaktam vibhakteshu tajjyanam vidhisatvikam that's 1820. So avibhaktam vibhakteshu that there is one indivisible reality beyond all the variable realities that are seen at the surface or the material level. That is knowledge in the mode of goodness. So if we could extrapolate this specifically, it refers to how, so to put it in one way is in goodness, they say matter and spirit both. So it's more of a holistic vision. In a passion, there is only material vision and material vision in pursuance of one's desires. And in ignorance, there is not even a complete material vision. There is only that part of material reality which reinforces one's conceptions. That is knowledge in the mode of ignorance. So we could say that uh, many people have prejudices. Say some people have prejudices or biases. And when they are prejudiced or biased is what happens basically. So if somebody has a prejudice that okay, people from this community are like this. Say people from this religion are like this. People from this country are like this. Then whoever they see, those people who behave like that, that reinforces their idea. And if anybody doesn't behave like that, they just reject that idea. They just reject that perception. It doesn't just enter it. They don't even process it. They neglect it completely. So that is how people live in what is often called as an echo chamber. Eco chamber is we hear only those who agree with us and we reject those who um, disagree with us. We don't, so even when we are learning something, we are not learning, we only think we are learning. So we will, at one level, certain amount of processing of information is natural and unavoidable. The world is just too complicated for us to take in all of it. At the same time, so it's like, uh, so to give, go back to the driving metaphor once again, say, if I believe that this is a good locality and the road here is smooth, then, okay, uh, the road might be smooth, sometimes the road might not be smooth. But if I just don't look at the portions where there are bumps or there are potholes or there are other disruptive features of the territory, then that is unhealthy. So we need to see the reality as it is. And if we don't, then it's problematic. So that is the challenge over here. So it's like, I have, a, I'm, I'm not even looking at the reality. I have a map and the map has completely covered my eyes. So I don't even see the territory. I see only my map. So to function holistically, okay, I have my map and this is the territory and the map should guide me in looking at the territory. But, but a map is all that I see. So that is, One takes one aspect of reality and makes it the complete reality. One does not understand reality. One does not understand one's overall purpose. One has meager knowledge, but one thinks one has a lot of knowledge. So one may get a lot of information, but that information only reinforces one's pre-existing conceptions. So in that sense, this knowledge, the, the, the more knowledge one gets, knowledge in terms of informational content, one may get a lot of knowledge, but that knowledge is not removing ignorance. It is actually reinforcing ignorance because it simply 
making us believe that we know things when only when we only uh, we will see things only from one very narrow perspective so there is uh, science and there is scientism scientism is the idea that science alone has monopoly on all reality on all knowledge of reality that anything that can't be known by science that doesn't exist at all so that is i'll explain that a little bit further but that is an example of knowledge in the mode of ignorance so if you consider the kinds of knowledge you can your knowledge can remove ignorance knowledge can reduce ignorance knowledge can reinforce ignorance so we, uh, the best effect of knowledge is that it removes ignorance the worst effect is that knowledge reinforces ignorance now what do we mean by reinforces ignorance that it just does that one just re it reinforces one's existing conceptions and it when it blinds us to other I, other perceptions of reality or other aspects of reality from being perceived <clears throat> so we could say knowledge in the mode of goodness removes ignorance knowledge in the mode of ignorance reinforces ignorance and the knowledge in the mode of passion depending on how much it is influenced by goodness or ignorance it will have the effect of either removing or reinforcing ignorance in people in passion they have certain perception of reality it reduces ignorance but still it's not a holistic perception of reality so i mentioned earlier about scientism being a like there is communism capitalism so there is scientism so why is that lopsided what's wrong with that now when we perceive the world <clears throat> there is something called cognitive dualism that is constantly at play so if we are looking at a painting <coughs> now what exactly do we see when we see a painting do we just see various colors various paints that have been used to make those colors or do we actually see a maybe it's a painting of something like mona lisa so do we see a do we see a serene or sublimely beautiful face so now are there various paints over there yes they are there is there a face over there yes that's also there so now it depends on what we are going to focus on depending on what we fo if if i'm only focusing on individual colors or if i'm focusing on the paints then all that i will see is paints but if i'm trying to look at a holistic pattern i'll see a face now what is the reality well both are real that there is a face being depicted over there and there are there are various colors being used over there so there are various paints which are uh, dabbed on the canvas or it's you could say if it's a digital painting then there are various pixels of different colors but there are both ways of perceiving and both are important or say if there's a brain scientist or if there's a brain surgeon a brain specialist doctor neurosurgeon they in office if somebody says i'm not feeling well then they might do a brain scan and try to find out okay what is wrong with that person especially if there's they have a they have problem which is related with the brain so they when somebody comes to them as a patient then they will have a particular way of processing Now, if that same brain surgeon goes back home and say their partner says that um, I'm upset. Now, will that brain surgeon say that? Oh, let me do a brain scan to find out why you're upset. Well, the partner will say you go and scan your brain first. You know, maybe if the partner is upset at that time, they have to they have to sit and talk and understand what has what has displeased them, what has made them upset. So. the scientific method of knowing of say doing a brain scan to find out what's wrong that is one way of looking at things and looking at people to understand their emotions to understand their perspectives that's uh, talking with them that's another way of looking at things so this is cognitive dualism dualism dual means two so two ways of perceiving we are talking about uh, knowledge in terms of perception so cognition is we take in information so that we understand it So cognition is understanding. 
perceiving so that we can understand properly so proper perception is so cognition you could equate with perception over here so when we function at different times we use the appropriate means of perceiving so are we seeing the physical reality or are we seeing a metaphysical reality so for now for example now say if we are at a store and we give some cash and we are supposed to give say 10 dollars but we by mistake give a 20 dollar note mm -hmm. and then we walking away and the store attendant we call the call calls us back please come actually you give 20 dollars you can have this 10 dollars back there's only 10 you need to give oh say so that that's that's remarkably honest of you you might say now honesty there is no label honesty for that action over there mm -hmm. there is no label you know all that happened was instead of 10 dollars we gave 20 and they gave 10 back so if we just had a camera uh, recording that event all that would happen okay this currency went this currency went but we are assessing or we are perceiving certain values in action over there so now those values are they a physical reality is honesty a physical reality can you have a honesty meter to show how much honesty is there in a person you know honesty is a important virtue but we can't have a honesty meter so there is physical reality and there is non physical reality also or trans physical reality it could be subtle material reality it could be spiritual reality but we perceive that so you know so the point i'm making is that if somebody were only perceiving physical reality they would not be able to function at all in life now even materialists people who are materialists they perceive uh, things beyond just simple physical physical data so even atheists recognize that morality is required in society and they try to come up with ideas by which how from a purely physicalist conception of the world some amount of morality can come up now it's very difficult and very speculative uh, why and how morality comes up but still the point is that there is this cognitive dualism and that means when we process reality we are not just processing facts based on facts we are um, we are ascribe we are inferring certain values we are assigning certain properties and now sometimes this, the, what we are assigning the properties we are assigning may be correct they may be incorrect that's a different issue but the point is to function effectively in life we need to um, process information at the appropriate level say if we have a small child who is say maybe 3 years old or 4 years old very small and say the child has their own small play room and say hey, your play room is such a big mess you are such a bad boy uh, and now the your play room is a mess you are a bad boy the child will not be able to perceive what does it mean they may will perceive that we are upset and they will feel afraid why are you upset with me but to explain things to them maybe you know okay pick this toy and put this over there you know pick this and put this there and the child picks it up and puts it there he smiles oh good and we smile at him and he says oh good let's we smile the child feels reassured and then he says okay pick this up and put it there okay pick that up and put it there and every time we we approve it so now 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 the room is tidy oh the child may not understand what a tidy room means so we have to break the idea of a tidy room down to a level where the child can understand and as the child grows up the child understands okay this is a tidy room this is an untidy room so tidiness is it a physical reality well yes it is a physical reality in the sense that things are in their places but the point is that it's a inference which we arrive at when things are in their places or if somebody is a somebody is a orderly person somebody is a disorderly person now what do we mean by that it's a value it's so values are also what we perceive but 
the, how do we perceive those values? They are based on actions, but they are not contained in the actions themselves. They are inferred from the actions. So, for us to function in life, we cannot purely function at the simply empirical level. From the empirical, we move toward. From the level of empirical observations, we arrive at some inferences. So that's cognitive dualism, and of course, beyond that, that is substance dualism. So cognitive dualism means we perceive reality differently, but substance dualism means actually there are two levels of reality. And that is physical reality. It's not just a matter of perception. So it's beyond that. There are actual realities. There is matter and there is spirit. The two levels of reality. So here again, the point which I'm making here is that. perception is a complicated process and when i talked about this uh, cognitive dualism it is not that this happens only in the mode of goodness in the mode of goodness it happens accurately in the mode of ignorance also it's happening how is as i said earlier the mode of ignorance means to take one thing to be everything so people of this group are so stingy people from this particular regional group or or uh, national group are very stingy so we are saying that what are we doing we have observed some people behaving like that we have heard of some people behaving like that and based on that we have made some inference so that's what is inference so again that's that's also an inference so this cognitive dualism is happening there also but it's a imprecise cognitive dualism so arjuna when he's fighting in the kurukshetra war he is observing oh i am i want to fight against uh, i fight to fight against my relatives and fighting against them will be sinful and therefore i should not fight against them so he's observing the action is action is fighting but it's fighting against my relatives so he is making a value judgment based on that it is sinful activity i should not do it so krishna is actually except acknowledging that cognitive dualism but then he's saying that yes it's not sinful if you are doing it for dharma because there is substance dualism there is matter and there is spirit there is and you may be your fighting may kill their kill them at the material level but at the soul level of the soul they will be elevated so there is a lot going on for our perception to happen properly so when you talk about knowledge in the mode of ignorance what actually happens uh, it is about a fragment of reality it is oblivious to the totality of reality and it doesn't give us any meaningful purpose in life we may have a purpose but it's not a meaningful purpose so it it makes us believe that we know a lot while we know only a little this is knowledge in the mode of ignorance then now let's look at intelligence and its levels so we talked till now about how we perceive reality then we now now we want to talk about what we pursue so how do we act in life so intelligence in the three modes we could have intelligence and ignorance is what we justify our current misbehavior and we per perpetuate our wrongs oh, now why did i do like this and this is this the way i am this is the way i am going to function now duryodhana in the mahabharat then his many wrong doings were pointed out to him he said that you know this is just the way i am if you have to blame anyone blame the creator if the creator has made me like this why blame me so this is actually ignorance why because yes there are certain conditioning that we can't change but that doesn't mean there is nothing we can change about us there is a lot that we can change lot that we should change then in the mode of passion what happens again we pursue only those things which we find desirable and there might be some amount of regulation also but it's only for sensual purposes only for material purposes so in the mode of goodness we understand what is actually desirable and we pursue accordingly so actually uh, the verse i started with today was a wrong verse it's not 1835 it should be 1832 because 1835 is about determination whereas 1832 is about uh, intelligence so intelligence is where dutyaya dharayate mana pranendriya kriya yogena vicharinya dutti sa partha satviki krishna says that when one understands So that is actually that is intelligence in the mode of goodness. In the mode uh, that is sorry that is determination in the mode of goodness. So determination is talked about from eighteen thirty three to thirty five, and intelligence in the three modes is talked about in terms of um, 
हाव बुद्धि सा पार्थ सात्विकी प्रवृत्तिम च निवृत्तिम च कार्याकार्य भया भये बंधम मोक्षम च या व्यक्ति बुद्धि सा पार्थ सात्विकी so when understand when one understands what way of acting in the world is beneficial what way of acting in the world is harmful what entangles what liberates what should be done what should not be done that is intelligence in the mode of goodness and ayathavat prajanati adharmam dharmam iti ya manyate tamasavrata sarvarthan viparitam ischa buddhi sapartha tamasi when krishna says that which is a wrong thing one pursues it to be the right thing adharmam dharmam itiya manyate tamasavrataha those are the people who are covered by the mode of ignorance and sarvarthan viparitam ischa buddhi sapartha tamasi that is intelligence in the mode of ignorance so <clears throat> so going back to the example of driving okay this is the lane i should drive on this is the this is the side of the road i should drive on that's 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 actually not just awareness but one drives accordingly the ability to drive properly that is intelligence but when one doesn't have that then one drives in a way that is destructive that is that sabotages oneself one lives in a way that harms oneself that is intelligence in the mode of ignorance so we may perceive things wrongly and then we may pursue wrong things so these two are related but the two can be separate also in the mode of goodness we understand what is worth pursue, pursuing in life and then we pursue it accordingly but in intelligence in ignorance we are pursuing the wrong thing but we try to we persuade ourselves and we persuade others that it is the right thing and that's how sometimes people justify uh, what they are doing as uh, even if it is wrong or justified as right and this is where we come into the domain of rationalization where rationalize means we tell rational lies we lie to ourselves we mislead ourselves so what happens in intelligence so we end up doing the things we don't need to do but believe that we need to do so our we are pursuing things that that are not necessary for us say for example advertising in the world today there is much of the advertising is brilliant brilliant in terms of the way ideas are marketed the way idea with the products are presented there is an extraordinary amount of intelligence that goes into the marketing industry and say suppose if you are going to watch a watch some tv serial it's a 30 minute tv serial and whatever say if even if it is a like a star wars tv serial or something which is quite, which is quite a high budget kind of tv serial but within that there might be say 3 3 to 3 minutes of commercial and usually the um, the budget that goes for making the 3 minute commercial may well be equal to if not more than what went for making the 30 minute tv serial mm. why is that because at one level mm, the the 3 the now it may, actually a uh, commercial may not even be 3 3 minutes it might be one by 30 seconds and there might be six commercials like that but whatever it is that those are those are very carefully thought out to trigger particular desires in people so that they do certain things so what kind of images what kind of sounds what kind of cumulative effect will most affect the people uh, what kind of special effects will have the most uh, activating effect on people that's what is brought together and that's what is defected over there so what is happening over there say intelligence is being used but sometimes that intelligence is being used to manipulate people and that is intelligence used for a ignorant purpose so it might be others using intelligence to keep us in ignorance or sometimes we might pursue things that aggravate our ignorance also so that is intelligence in ignorance where we function in a way that that harms us but we don't rectify ourselves because that's what we believe so advertisement is the evil genius that makes us believe that we know we need more than our life the things that we don't need at all and its people are ready to believe that absolute necessities things which may be 
utter luxuries and it will become crazy for getting those things so how does that happen because there is a wrong perception and there is a wrong action thereafter so if we move forward as is the driving metaphor i had used earlier that if you compare driving to living then knowledge is like the map and intelligence is like our driving ability so we have to have driving awareness and driving ability both so now things can become complicated if you can say so i said knowledge can be in intelligence so ignorance passion and goodness and intelligence can be in ignorance passion and goodness and we sometimes say that okay this person is in goodness this person is in passion this person is in ignorance we think of those mo these modes as quite uh, discrete or disjoint uh, uh, but it is not necessarily like that that means a person might have say knowledge their knowledge might be in goodness but their action might be their intelligence might be in ignorance their knowledge might be in passion but their intelligence might be in ignorance so it could be you know it could be all of these so just because we have knowledge and intelligence doesn't mean our so knowledge and ignorance doesn't mean our intelligence also has to be in ignorance like some people may have very good driving ability but they just have a wrong map some people may have a good map but they may be terrible drivers so we need to <clears throat> so somebody uh, somebody who is having a good map but they are bad drivers then essentially what is happening is they may have a lot of informational content in them but the way they function in life may be terrible and on the other hand somebody may be a good driver but they have a wrong map then so somebody who has a good map but poor driving ability they may be going toward the right destination but they will damage their car along the way they may cause damage to others cars and that will be troublesome on the other hand if somebody has a poor driving ability even if they have a good map then what is going to happen sorry if they, they, on the other hand if they have a poor map if they have good driving ability you know they may be driving smoothly but they will not get to a destination desired destination so it's uh, the same person it is knowledge and intelligence are different faculties and it's not necessary that a person's knowledge will be in goodness person's intelligence will also be in goodness it may not necessarily be like that it may vary that's why the way the modes interact is quite complicated at the start of the bhagavad gita krishna says to tells arjuna that <clears throat> that the first verse that krishna speaks actually to arjuna is ashocha nanushochasta pragya vadam sya bhashase gatasu na gatasu sya nanushochanti panditah you are speaking wise words your but your emotions are unwise your actions are unwise so he is saying that there is a dissonance over there there is a dissonance between the kind of words you are speaking and the kind of emotions and actions you are having so that is one indication of how knowledge and intelligence might correlate in complicated complex ways so we need to arise in such a way that our knowledge and our intelligence both uh, elevate us both uplift us if we look at one example of this kind of ignorance in today's world um, what's happening over here so if we look at say secularism now um, i'm talking here about how something good might end up becoming something bad because of the complex correlations that may happen say secularism's degeneration there are many isms in the world which start off as with good intentions but they may end up becoming complicated they may become being not as complicated degenerated so it started as neutrality toward religion and that's fair enough now as the uh, world started becoming more and more connected you see in the past before say trains were invented before ships were invented before ships became like really sophist somewhat sophisticated before planes were invented and became widespread communication between people from different parts of the world was different was was difficult so different people had different cultures different places had different cultures they had their own world views they had their own religions so quite often the state was neutral toward religion and this was especially true in india 
you know, when Maharaj Yudhishthir was ruling the kingdom, Yudhishthir was a Vaishnava. But at that time, in his kingdom, there were Shaivites, there were Shaktas, there were impersonalists, there were a wide variety of people. And when he respected the Brahmanas, it was not just that he respected only the Vaishnavas and he disrespected everyone else. He respected everyone. So secularism is, in that sense, if we talk about secularism as neutrality toward religion, that is something which is quite a central Vedic value. The king's duty was to establish dharma, not to enforce bhakti. The king's duty is to, dharma refers to basic moral conduct in society. So, or we could call, talk of dharma in this context as law and order. The king's duty was to establish law and order in society. And beyond that, everybody is at their particular level on spiritual growth and everybody will perceive, uh, pursue spiritual growth accordingly. So there were facilities for people to pursue what they wanted to pursue. So now, of course, it is not neutrality in terms of passivity. And I'll talk about that difference that um, we have examples of, of um, the Pandavas in the forest meeting shy white sages. We have the example of Pandavas worshipping the Devutas also for that matter. It was not that worshipping the Devutas was taboo for them. So now we might say this is all within the Vedic tradition and that's true. Yes, if we consider other religions, what we call other religions, they were not there at the time of the Mahabharata. But the state was not enforcing any particular religion. And this, we could say, secularism in, in that sense, it's actually humility in the domain of politics. Why humility? Humility in the sense that the, the king cannot rule on matters of the heart. The king can rule in matters of the world. So there are actions which are going to be harmful to society, harmful to other people. If you rob someone, if you do this, you do that, that is wrong. But what you meditate on, like belief cannot be legislated. Belief has to be inspired. So uh, in, in one sense, that separation between state and church or state and religion, what is talked about, that is very much there uh, in the Vedic tradition, that the dharma and there is bhakti and the two are separate. So the bhakti is to be inspired and dharma is to be enforced. Dharma, dharma in terms of basic morality has to be enforced. So uh, basic law and order has to be enforced. So Krishna comes to do that. Now, uh, Krishna doesn't kill people just because say, they are uh, believing something wrong. Uh, or, Krishna, or even devotees, uh, the Pandavas, uh, on the Pandava side, Drupada was a shy white. On the Kaurava side, uh, Bhishma was a Vaishnava. On the Kaurava side, Bhurishrava was a Vaishnava. On the Kaurava side, uh, there were different kinds of people. And Bhurishrava was killed, although he was a Vaishnava, because he, he was fighting on the side of Adharma. So, um, so secularism in the sense of the state not enforcing matters of the heart, that is fair enough. In fact, uh, uh, it is to some extent when, the, when faith starts being enforced, then it leads to problems. It leads to fanaticism. Because then what happens? Generally, whenever any, anybody starts enforcing a law, hmm, there's a principle which, uh, which, which is implicit in the Dharma Shastras that when a law is to be enforced, you should consider not only the good that can be done when this law is enforced by good people, but you should also consider the bad that can be done when this law is enforced by bad people. So if, if the state or the head of state has complete autocratic power, then they might be able to do certain good, th good things. But if they have complete autocratic power, they might be able to do terrible things also. So there was, there was a jurisdiction for the Kshatriyas, there was a jurisdiction for the Brahmanas, there was a jurisdiction for the Vaishyas, and everybody worked within their jurisdiction. So, sec so secularism in the sense of the state not enforcing matters of faith. That is, that is something which is very much of a Vedic value. Uh, and it came in the, 
Western world, this is called the West, 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 Westminster system of governance. It's in the political, if you study political philosophy, political history, you'll find that at one particular point, the government decided uh, various states were fighting a lot. Initially, say all of the European world was Catholic, under the Catholic Church. So the Catholic Pope was like the emperor, the king above all kings. But then there was the Protestant Reformation and there was a hundred year war. Say some countries sided with the Protestants, some sided, countries sided with the sided with the um, Catholics. And then that same war played out in other parts of the world also. So Spain, Portugal, Italy, they most of them were Catholics. And they went to South America and colonized South America. And Britain, France, other countries, these countries were, were Protestant and they came to India, they came to North America and they colonized North America. And there are wars over there also in some ways. But overall, after some time they realized that, that we put religion aside and the state's, go, state's purpose is to maintain law and order. And matters of faith needn't be enforced by the state. So to that extent, neutrality toward religion is good. But then slowly it became apathy toward religion. We don't care. So, and then today it has become not just apathy, it has become antipathy toward religion. So antipathy means that the state often makes rules which make, which make it difficult for people to say practice their religious values. Now secularism in India and secularism in America, they have certain levels of differences. Uh, and I won't go into the technicalities of that. But when, uh, when one recognizes that, okay, there's a domain of heart that cannot be legislated, and that is a reasonable point, that's acceptable. But when one goes further and says that, now, the domain of the heart is completely subjective and whatever you do with the heart, it doesn't matter at all for society. Well, it's not that simple. It's not that simple. That you know, Sometimes they say, what people do in your personal life, it doesn't matter. What matters only what you're doing in your public life. So if the head of state has a, like uh, illicit affairs, but if the economy is good, that's all that matters. Well, is it that simple? It's not exactly that simple. So if we consider antipathy toward religion in today's world, there are many examples of how, say for example, in today's world, abortion is not only uh, not only legal, but often it is legally enforced. In the recent uh, lockdowns that were there in various parts of the world. So many of the religious places were closed and uh, now slowly in some parts of the world, religious places are being opened. But throughout this time, religious places were closed, but abortion clinics were open. So religious worship was not considered to be essential service, but abortion was considered to be an essential service. So now the say, say, it may be saying that we are not involving ourselves with religion, but they are, they are in a particular way. So what are they doing? Okay, this is important, this is essential, this is not essential. On what basis are you deciding this is essential, this is not essential. So that indicates that there is a certain amount of antipathy toward religion. So what's happening over here, that how we are functioning in life is becoming increasingly disconnected from life's overall purpose, from life's bigger picture. And that is, that is how uh, people might be, might be themselves, not the people who are in the government, we don't, we don't want to condemn them by calling them ignorant. But to make the government system function, it requires a lot of intelligence. The fact that we have electric power, we have internet that is working, we have our basic amenities. So that indicates a certain amount of resourcefulness over there. But at the same time, if the value system underlying it all is not sound, then it can lead to catastrophic uh, effects in society. So here we are talking about, so in English, you know, there is, uh, there is not a clear word to differentiate between say dharma and bhakti. You know, is dharma, what is dharma? Is dharma a religion? Well, when Krishna says he has come to establish dharma, he's talking of dharma more in terms of law and order in society. Now is bhakti religion? 
well bhakti is also not exactly religion bhakti is more like devotion and that's one aspect of religion religion many people have different meanings and diff- different ideas so in that sense so neutrality toward the object of devotion that is that is fine but antipathy toward morality and antipathy towards the basic values in society that is unhealthy so this is how if life becomes too compartmentalized then things can become destructive and that is what needs to be avoided so now um we'll talk about this further i talked about complex correlations so with with this last graph we will conclude this talk today that how knowledge and intelligence might interact so if somebody has knowledge but they don't have intelligence that means they have a map but they don't have they have driving awareness but they don't have driving ability they have a map but they they, they can pursue things properly but they can't they're not pursuing things healthily then they have a direction they have a map they are well directed but they are not well regulated if somebody has neither intelligence nor knowledge then they are neither regulated nor directed that is destructive if somebody has intelligence but not knowledge then they are regulated but they are not spiritually directed if somebody has intelligence and knowledge both then they are di- regulated and directed regulated means okay you are driving properly directed means and you are going to a desired destination so the gita encourages arjuna to live in a way that is both regulated and directed and that is what we will that is what it inspires us to do and krishna will talk about in the next chapter or we will discuss in the next session about how work can also become a form of worship when one has proper knowledge and intelligence and then we'll talk about how there are various levels of functioning based on the various levels of yoga and how all of them are ultimately meant to connect us with the lord the ultimate reality is that krishna is the source of all knowledge and is the goal of all intelligence and when we understand this then what happens is when our sen- when our consciousness is krishnaized then our knowledge and intelligence both become our friends and they help us to make our life meaningful and successful so i'll summarize what i spoke today i discussed the theme of knowledge and interaction knowledge and uh, intelligence and its various levels of interaction so how somebody might be knowledgeable yet knowledgeably ignorant or somebody might be intelligently foolish so we, i discuss knowledge in the three modes then i discuss intelligence in the three modes and then we discuss their interactions so knowledge in the three modes means talked about knowledge is more in terms of perception so if you are perceiving only one fragment of reality even one fragment of material reality then that is knowledge in the mode of ignorance if you are perceiving only material reality that is knowledge in the mode of passion and if you are perceiving material and spiritual reality that is knowledge in the mode of goodness so when we function we all function with cognitive dualism that means we observe specifics so that's physical parameter that we pursue based on that we arrive at certain metaphysical inferences and that's just everybody does that but the cognitive dualism needs to be grounded in substance dualism it's not just two levels of perception there are two levels of reality there is material and spiritual reality and based on how somebody is doing that it might be accurate or inaccurate so people who are prejudiced their knowledge doesn't remove their ignorance that doesn't even reduce their ignorance it reinforces their ignorance so i talk about knowledge in terms of driving awareness and intelligence in terms of driving ability so how one pursues in perceives information and then what one pursues 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 based on that information that's intelligence then i talk about intelligence in the three modes in terms of uh, how intelligence in goodness leads to regulated living okay this is what i should do this is what i should not do and then one acts accordingly intelligence in the mode of ignorance means one acts in a way that is uh, that one perpetuates and aggravates one, one just justifies one's wrong behavior and perpetuates or aggravates that behavior so then we talked about how knowledge and ignorance so knowledge and intelligence in the three modes may interact in complex ways i took the example of scientism as one example of knowledge in the mode of ignorance and then we took the example of secularism 
how if there is ex excessive compartmentalization it can lead to problems so in terms of recognizing that the government cannot legislate matters of belief that is intrinsic uh, in the vedic culture the dharma is meant to be legislated not bhakti but from that to just say that the government becomes antipathetic toward basic values that are grounding society then that becomes unhealthy and undesirable so if we krishnaize our consciousness by studying spiritual wisdom then both our knowledge and our intelligence will become our friends and our life will become both well directed and well regulated so we can say knowledge helps us to direct our life and intelligence helps us to regulate our life uh, and both together make our life meaningful and fruitful thank you very much hare krishna so are there any questions okay thank you param karuna prabhu thank you <clears throat> medhavi sakhi mata ji so does maya put us in ignorance and that's why we act blindly yes of course maya means literally means illusion and illusion is one aspect of ignorance so now i don't know exactly what is the question over here does maya put us in ignorance are you saying that maya is responsible for our going into ignorance no maya is not responsible we are responsible uh, but it is we but it is maya who provides us those options and then we choose one of those options and then we go into ignorance so mm, i'm not sure what exactly is the question over here i mean it's a straight forward philosophical point that maya is the maya is a agency uh, maya is a factor but it's not that maya is causing ignorance within us it is that maya is like a teacher who is conducting an exam and the teacher gives wrong options but the teacher is not making us choose the wrong options so yeah did i address your question yes, prabhu something different yeah yeah prabhu i think uh, my 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 point was uh, i know we act so blindly and we don't realize I mean, maybe in subconsciously we think you know we may be doing something but uh, what i'm saying is we go after something and we realize after the fact that oh i should not have done how how ignorant i you know we are at the time so i think that's where i want to get a oh, clarity okay. like yeah. how how would how, how would we have avoided that situation right okay, sometimes okay. i, got that I feel like yeah. yes thank you so basically you know if we are already in ignorance and then how do we actually how do we actually come out of it what causes it yeah is it so maya is definitely there and uh, maya's influences are there within our consciousness they are there within our circumstances also so we need to begin wherever we can that means say there are some things which are white some things which are black and in between there is a lot of shades of gray that means there are some things which we know we should do there are some things which we know we should not do and apart from that there are a lot of things which maybe i know i'm not sure whether i should do this or should not do this so what we can do is instead of starting with the shades of gray we start with the black and white and at least try to do the things which we know are right and try to avoid doing the things which we know are not right and gradually from there we can grow so it's not easy to counter ignorance because first at all we have to we have to recognize the ignorance but wherever we are able to recognize it at least act over there so in general the growth in any area is incremental so just like when we are exercising we don't suddenly start lifting big weights even if we go to a gym where everybody else is lifting big weights we may try to find the small weights which we can lift and we start from there so similarly we start with basics and we move forward from there so just begin from what is what we what we are clear is black and white and then address the issues address the shades of gray okay thank, thank you, you prabhu on the follow up fo yeah, follow up ahead. question on this one on the follow up question on this one so now i i had you know situations where i feel now that you know things have happened in my ignorance and now one one thought comes to my mind is maybe it has to happen because of my previous karma meaning no no matter what i would have not avoided so meaning how do we understand our destiny versus uh, what we can control yeah 
that's tough. See, sometimes uh, when we look back at our life, certain decisions we have taken, now we understand that those decisions are wrong. But at that time, maybe it was that supposed to happen by destiny? Yeah, you know, what is right and what is wrong, it's not so easy to decide. You know, sometimes uh, we may say that, I think I mentioned this in one of our earlier classes, that there is the content of what we are doing, there is the intent why we are doing it, and there is the consequence of what we do. So all three are important. So the content of what we do is important, no doubt. The intent why we are doing it is also important. So if somebody is taking a knife and cutting somebody else, normally that would be alarming. But if a surgeon is doing that, then the intent is actually to treat the patient. That's good. But then suppose that surgery leads to the death of the patient. So now it may be because of some unexpected complication that happened, because of maybe the surgeon was incompetent in some way, maybe some whatever happened. So the intent was not bad. The content was also right at that time, but the consequence was bad. Then maybe afterward, the doctors learned that, the surgeons learned that, okay, you know, actually this, these kind of patients, when they are exposed to these situations, they are vulnerable in particular ways. So now, for example, uh, all over the world, there's a vigorous attempt to develop the COVID vaccine. Mm, uh, now, <clears throat> we presume that the intent is good and they want to treat people and the content is they provide making some medicine, but sometimes certain vaccines have to be stopped because the consequences are, are not very, not good. There are some contraindicative effects of something. So then we stop it. So basically the thing is that sometimes we learn what is right and what is wrong based on consequences alone, or rather the intent and content, they are overridden by the consequence. So intent matters, content matters, and consequence also matters. But in some cases, the consequence may turn out to be so destructive, say, if we want to correct someone, our intent is good. And we also speak in a, uh, we also speak in a proper regulated way. We don't, uh, we don't like condemn the person, but still they become so defensive, aggressive that afterward we decide, no, I'm not going to correct this person at all. So that now that is we learn from the consequence and maybe that is the best policy because otherwise they just become our enemies or they treat us as our, their enemies. So whatever, we don't want that to happen. So sometimes the consequence determines the rightness or the wrongness of the action. Uh, and then in that case, what can we do? We learn only from the consequence. So sometimes we can learn beforehand. Sometimes we just learn afterward. So then in those situations, we can say that it is just destiny. But that doesn't mean that everything, uh, every bad consequence that comes was destined. Sometimes it might just be that um, going back to the, uh, say, going back to the driving metaphor, say we are driving along a particular road and the road is normally smooth and clear and we drive fast uh, or we drive at a good speed. But say, you know, we come to a particular turn and there, um, maybe there is a big pothole or a big ditch or something like that and our car meets with some kind of accident. Now, what can we do? Now, that is supposed to be a smooth road and we were, we were not driving above the speed limit but still that accident happened. So, well, we could say at that time it's destiny but suppose we were talking on phone and not just talking on phone but talking with maybe highly distracted because of that, holding the phone and not having holding the wheel properly or we had not slept enough and we are half sleepy or somebody else we're drunk and then they're driving and then they meet with an accident then that is a different factor so it's best that uh, you know we if there is something to be learned from a particular situation we learn and move on and sometimes despite our best efforts or whatever was possible because it's very difficult to quantify what is best also in a particular situation but despite our whatever efforts we put in, if things go wrong, then we accept them as destiny and move on. So I'll conclude with the two examples. Say, Bhishma fought on the side of the Kauravas. And 
okay not bishma was fighting on the side of the kauravas bishma was fighting and duryodhana was fighting so both of them in one sense were fighting on the side of adharma but are both of them at a, a morally equivalent level no you know we could say bishma was circumstantially constrained to fight you know long ago he had taken a vow by which he was bound to fight now we could go into arguing uh, when he was going against krishna did he have to stick to that vow couldn't he have just given up that vow that's a different discussion uh, uh, but the point is that he was circumstantially constrained to fight there because he had taken that vow now duryodhana had no such vow like that Duryodhana, out of his own malevolence, was fighting. So, although both of them were doing the same action, we could say that Duryodhana, Bhishma, is having to fight on the side of the Kauravas, was due to destiny. Whereas Duryodhana's fighting in on that same side was due to his own perverse intelligence, because it was not it was not because of destiny; it was because of perversity. So, because of his. Uh, because of his envy because of his anger because of his um, obstinacy and the bhagavad gita itself differentiates between these two kinds of warriors in in the 11th chapter when it says that there are some warriors who are like the rivers going toward the ocean and there are some warriors who are like moths going toward the fire so it presumably we can say that acharya has explained that warriors like bhishma are Uh, the river is going toward the ocean it's natural flow everybody has to die and uh, they die over there but duryodhana is like moth going toward the fire he he is he's intentionally chosen the course of action which leads to fighting so does that answer your question yes prabhu thank you very much alex mm -hmm. oh god and questions have come up now okay you mentioned about maya giving us So okay. So from Param Karan Bro, there's a question that if we keep making wrong choices, then does Maya give us more wrong choices, and then we become conditioned more? Yes. Do we develop a taste for wrong choices? Yes, of course that happens, and that's why it's like a. It's not just a dyna. It's not just a like a static test. It's more like a dynamic test. A dynamic test means that. Uh, a static test would be that we are already given say 10 50 100 questions and those are the what are going to come one after another after another but a dynamic test will be that okay if you give the previous answer wrong then maybe the next question will be shaped accordingly uh, at a lower level if you give answer right then the next question will be at a higher level so there is dynamic testing and there is static testing so nowadays Uh, so if we consider it in terms of a live interview like a viva test or something like that if you have a written paper that will be all predefined questions but if you are actually having an interview then based on the kind of question how we answer questions the interviewer might choose ch change their questions to see how much we know of a particular subject so we could say that exams of maya are not like that fixed written paper it's not like a static testing it's a dynamic testing and at one level although we may say that we have taste for wrong choices but still even within that also we can we can choose how much we indulge somebody might be say hooked to alcohol but whether they are taking uh, one drink or two drinks or five drinks or 10 drinks that may still be up to them so sometimes the the scope of our choices may change based on our previous choices but the fact that we can choose doesn't change and just like somebody might because of in the dynamic testing because of many wrong answers now the questions themselves are super simple for them okay but even then they can choose wrong and they can go further down they can choose right and they can come up so wherever we are we have the capacity to choose rightly and from where we are we can either move upward or downward okay 
Okay. The last question now. So, Medhavan Sakhi Mata Ji, that uh, is the mind superior to the intelligence or the intelligence superior to the mind? Why is the mind said to be the product of ego in goodness and intelligence is said to be the product of ego in passion? Okay, there are uh, different things going on over here. Mm, let's put it this way that uh, I could go into the technicalities of Sankhya and give an answer based on that. But I will talk about it from the functional perspective. See, the mind's function broadly is to perpetuate our material existence. And the intelligence function is to expand our material existence. So what do I mean by this? If we consider technological advancement, you know, there's a lot of intelligence over there. But what has technological advancement done in many cases? It has simply expanded the opportunities and avenues for worldly enjoyment. So in the past, maybe even 50 years ago, if somebody wanted to entertain themselves, they would have to buy or they got to go to a theater, buy a ticket and watch a movie. And they could only watch the movies that were there in their local theaters. But now, you know, just with internet, we can just sit in our homes and we can watch more movies uh, than, we can watch more movies within a week than what many people could watch within a year in the past. So if you consider with respect to obscenity, you know, that uh, people can access today in five minutes more obscenity than what people in the past could access in their whole lifetime. And so what has happened is, although there is, there is intelligence involved over there, the intelligence has simply expanded the avenues for worldly gratification. So from the perspective of uh, functionality, goodness is about maintenance and passion is about creation or expansion. So the mind is associated with sankalpa vikalpa. Do this, don't do this, do this, do this or that, do this or that. You know, it keeps us giving us options. But the intelligence expands the options. So in that sense, if we consider the expansion of material existence happens through intelligence. The maintenance of material existence happens through the mind. So if we consider animals, their intelligence is not very developed. So what do they do? They also have a mind like us. But say a cow will eat the same kind of grass that it has always been eating for generations. But we humans want to cook so many different kinds of food and we use our creativity to cook those foods. So intelligence basically expands the options. So that's why intelligence is said to be in the mode of passion. Now that's in terms of functionality. However, we can also say that intelligence can expand not only our material options, intelligence can expand our spiritual options also. So with our intelligence, say now when we're not able to go to temples, we started resourcefully using online technology to attend more and more classes, make things more and more interactive. So if we could say that in terms of functionality, mind is associated with mode of goodness because the mind keeps reproposing the same things again and again. Puna punash charvita charvanana. Whereas the intelligence not only reproposes the same things, but the intelligence reproposes the same things in newer and newer ways. Uh, the same intelligence can be directed spiritually, then it can provide us newer and newer ways to connect with spirituality. So for us, when we are when we are trying to grow spiritually, we need to use our intelligence to, to regulate our mind and not use our intelligence to facilitate our mind. That means that whatever desires are present in the mind, the intelligence can either obey and then, okay, how can I fulfill this desire? How can I fulfill this desire? How can I fulfill this desire? That's the intelligence becoming the servant of the mind. But intelligence can be used to regulate the desires. Regulate means, okay, these are the desires in the mind. Are these really worth fulfilling? And then after we decide, okay, this desire is worth fulfilling. This desire is not worth fulfilling. 
then how do I go about fulfilling the desire? That also requires intelligence. So we could say that in terms of one particular way of analyzing, in terms of say the expansion of options, intelligence is uh, intelligence isn't the is a product of the mode of passion, but intelligence can also be so it's you know it's a little more subtle. It's it's not said intelligence is in the mode of passion. It is said intelligence is the product of ego in passion. The ego means ego is a sense of misidentification. So there is a certain level of misidentification that happens that is already there, and the mind maintains that. But the expansion of the misidentification happens because of the intelligence. However, we can also use our intelligence to to regulate our mind's desires and to elevate ourselves. So in terms of functionality, the intelligence is like a two-edged sword. The intelligence that obeys the mind becomes our enemy and aggravates our illusion. But the intelligence that, uh, that regulates the mind, that disciplines the mind, that becomes our friend and that elevates us. Does it answer your question? So thank you very much for your attention and participation. Hare Krishna.